Hmm, okay. <clears throat> okay. So we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to our uh, little seminar on argumentation and persuasion in writing. How many of you like writing? Do you like academic writing? Do you like writing research papers? No? Okay. I always have, actually. Uh, I'm that kind of person. I've always liked writing. <clears throat> and uh, that's why, as uh, both as a linguist and language teacher and as an education person, I have always been attracted to writing and the study of writing and teaching writing. And I'm going to talk today about aspects of effective argumentation and what argumentation is in academic writing, things like thesis and introduction, uh, the main arguments in the body of the paper, uh, a bit on using evidence and sources and such, argumentation, counter-argumentation. You have a handout. I don't follow the handout strictly. The handout kind of complements and has some extra points in addition to what I will talk about uh, verbally for my presentation. Uh, along the way, I'm going to talk about the sorts of things that I have seen as a writing teacher, the things that I see students having difficulties with, the common mistakes that students have difficulties with, either because they are simply new at academic writing or because they are writing in English as a second language. So let's go ahead and talk about getting started. What is argumentation? Uh, we think of argument in the popular sense of the word as this sort of thing. In academic writing, this is not what we mean by ar argumentation. Argumentation is an intelligent discussion. Uh, so not argument and argumentation in the popular sense, but in the academic sense of logical discussion of view differing viewpoints. Okay, so uh, getting started, we're going to look at what argumentation is, kind of the basic structure. Uh, if you've had a writing course, you may have seen some of this. Uh, argumentation is basically about in a paper presenting some, uh, some kind of a claim. Uh, you've got a main claim, which we call a thesis. You know what a thesis is, a thesis statement. Usually in the introduction or beginning of your paper, you have a thesis statement. That's the main idea of your paper. That's the main point you're arguing for. Uh, and that then is in turn supported by several other main uh, supporting arguments, other claims that support your thesis. So it's about presenting a claim, supporting it, supporting your claim with, with arguments, with evidence, with data, uh, uh, with, some, with some kind of support. Uh, and many times, either explicitly or implicitly, contrasting your ideas with someone else's. And uh, this is a, a point that's kind of hard for new writers to grasp because the academic writing that's expected to view at the college level is different from maybe high school writing. Uh, and as you get into higher levels of academia, junior, senior, graduate school, it, it's more and more strict about this. You don't just present your own arguments. Uh, in doing so, your goal is, by the way, to persuade other people that your argument, your interpretation is good, uh, or at least it's reasonable. It's a reasonable or plausible one. In doing so, you have to consider people who won't believe you. You have to Im consider that there will be skeptics, or there will be different viewpoints out there. And so a thesis, a good academic paper, um, is also presenting a contrast between your idea and maybe an opposing viewpoint or someone else's idea. Either explicitly, you might, it might be explicitly stated in the thesis that you are opposing an existing viewpoint and you're uh, formulating your, your own viewpoint. Or in the body of the paper, in the process of discussing points and main ideas in the body of the paper, you then may have to turn to other ideas are, that are out there and deal with them in order to argue and support your ideas. <clears throat> so in academic writing, you are kind of arguing for your um, viewpoint. And this is really true across different academic disciplines and fields, humanities, social sciences, or STEM, science, technology, education, math, or science, technology, engineering, math, what we call STEM fields. Uh, this is true across all fields, in different ways, though. So in humanities, 
you might be arguing for a particular interpretation. It could be an interpretation of a novel. It could be an interpretation of an historical event. It could be an interpretation of um, sociological events in a particular country uh, or an economic analysis of, of, of uh, broad-scale events in, in, in global markets or something like that. Um, in science, <coughs> also, you are in a sense, doing argumentative writing. So all academic writing, it is informative. You're informing your readers about facts and data and details, but at the same time, you are arguing for certain ideas. And even in science writing, this is true. In science writing, you are arguing that your analysis is legitimate and scientific. You are arguing that your hypothesis is true. You are arguing that your interpretation of a theory is true, or your application of a theory to a certain data set is valid and good, or that your invention uh, is engineering, engineering wise and scientific wise sound, or that the materials that you have engineered in the laboratory is a superior material than previous um, materials done by other processes. So science writing is also argumentative in a sense, uh, as well as informative. You are arguing uh, for the validity of your experiment, your process, uh, your hypothesis, or something like that. <clears throat> so what kind of evidence do you use? And that's another important consideration. Uh, sometimes new writers don't really have a good idea of what counts as evidence. And this really varies from field to field. So how many of you are in humanities? Humanities people? OK, so in your world, what counts as good evidence? What's your field? I'm English. English major. So are you doing English literature or linguistics? Literature. literature. OK. So in literature analysis, what's good evidence? If you're arguing for an interpretation of a novel or poem, what is good evidence for that? A book. <laughs> OK. Hopefully, some you're probably relying on, uh, on a scholar and his or her theories and ideas and arguing maybe that those theories or ideas kind of explain you know, the structure uh, of the novel or how the novel works or something like that. Uh, as long as you're not relying too much on one person, one scholar's authority, by the way. Uh, sometimes writers, you have to be careful not to make the mistake of putting too much, uh, relying too much on one scholarly authority because there could be differing viewpoints out there. Uh, but yeah, you may be looking at a particular scholarly analysis and how he or she analyzes a particular novel and such. Uh, what's your field? Hmm? Business. business, okay. Uh, so what, what is evidence to you in the business world? Okay, statistics, you kind of like science and social science in that sense. So for some business people, statistical data. And statistics is not just averages and counts. That's what the average person thinks of as statistics. Real statistics is a lot more sophisticated. You know, regression and, and, and ANOVAs and you know, fancy stuff like that that really, really tell you. Because averages and counts, you can manipulate that. You know, advertisers, politicians, they manipulate. They play with averages and counts. But in the world of science, social science, business, real statistics is something much more sophisticated that it's hard to lie with, uh, that kind of stuff. Science. What is evidence in science? What is good evidence in science? Hmm? An experiment. So you do an experiment, and it produces the data. The data either show that your hypothesis is correct, or that your hypothesis has to die, or maybe you have to go back and rework your hypothesis. Uh, so actual hard data, and often that involves statistical evidence as well, depending on the kind of science you're in. Many social sciences, too, are based on statistical data. So you really have to be aware of what is evidence in your field. Uh, because if you're relying on weak evidence, you're not going to communicate to the audience. The audience being one, your professor, to potentially other readers or other scholars, especially. If you go into grad school, PhD, uh, if you want to go the academic route further, uh, then you'll be communicating in writing, not with just your professors, but with other people out there in the world in your research writing. <coughs> um, so you have to think about what is good evidence. <coughs> uh, 
and that really affects your your um, view as a writing as a writer. Okay, so you probably know this if you've had a writing class uh, of any kind that this is the basic structure of an essay, right? You've seen something like this. You know that there is a thesis that's your main idea that's usually in the introduction uh, where you state the main idea of your paper. This is what this paper is arguing for. Then you have the body section. You have kind of major arguments. Uh, maybe in the body, the first paragraph or groups of paragraphs present kind of one main argument that supports the thesis. And that argument, in turn, probably has several sub-arguments or sub-points. In main argument two and three, these are different sections of your paper. Usually you have three to five. A typical scheme is three to five main sections. Uh, maybe each section or each argument has three to five sub-arguments, sub-points, or whatever. Why, why three to five? Why not eight? Why not two? Okay, well, two, of course, is too little to be convincing. Uh, but if five is convincing, why not go for eight or 13? It's, it's, it seems too much. It seems like the more, the better. Well, if you have that much, you could probably organize it into maybe three to five main points, and each of those have three to five subpoints instead of 13 or 23 random scattered things. That's because of human memory. And so for the sake of your reader, your reader is going to have an easier time if you tell the reader, you know, this is my thesis X. In order to show X, I'm going to look at and talk about A, B, and C. You have three to five main points. From the standpoint of working memory, human memory, it's easier for the readers to kind of hold that in working memory. So as they are reading your paper, they can kind of track this, you know, this is part of argument one, argument two, argument three, argument four. So it's easier for the readers to follow your flow of thought. And make, it's easier for you to make your flow of thought clear uh, when you have to organize things into three to five main points. It's easier for the readers to understand and not get lost. They're going to get lost mentally, psychologically, if they have to mentally track 13 points or even seven points. Uh, it's hard for the average person to do. <clears throat> now, of course, in science writing, they have a slightly different structure. It's kind of uh, modified from this. You kind of entertain maybe a research question in social science, too. Uh, you might kind of pose a research question. This is my research question, and this is my thesis about the research question. Uh, there are some fields of social science uh, where maybe you don't actually get to a research a thesis. Maybe you state your research question and you do more of an exploratory kind of analysis. So uh, there are some kinds of social science and education research where uh, in, instead of a really specific thesis, it's really a research question. Uh, we're going to look at such and such using such and such a method. Uh, and uh, but still, you're going to have a particular thesis. Um, then in a lot of science and social science writing, you have a literature review. What is a literature review? What's it for? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so the research background, what other people have done. So this is the research literature, published scholarly work, what other scholars have done and written about and published in the research literature. Uh, so you talk about what other people have done, what their findings were, or maybe in humanities, what their ideas were, what their analyses or interpretations were. Uh, why do you do this? Is it just good exercise as a writer to do this? No, why, why do you do this? This kind of lit review. Well, as a writer, you're trying to show that your thesis is something interesting. Um, that maybe your analysis, whether it's humanities, a literary analysis, or whether it's your analysis of a scientific experiment. You're, you're trying to show that your whole research project has value. Why are you doing this paper? Why are you trying to do this? Well, the Lit Review justifies that. Because in the Lit Review, you do probably at least one of two things. 
One, you're going to look at the previous research on your specific topic and you're going to <clears throat> use that as a rationale for your particular paper topic. That provides the rationale for your particular paper topic in um, one of several ways. One, you are uh, you could look at the previous research and point out a problem or a deficiency in the research. Maybe these people did these experiments on this, but uh, I think their research methodology wasn't quite correct or they forgot to take into account this factor. And so I'm going to do it better. And so your thesis is I'm going to do it better and, and show that this is the case. So one thing is to point out flaws or problems in previous research and say, I'm going to do a better job and I'm going to show this. Uh, another thing is to uh, say, okay, these people have done a good job here. They've used these theories and these tools to do this, but what about this issue? Here's something else that people haven't looked at yet, and I'm going to do that. So you're going to identify a gap, something new, something that hasn't been done, uh, at least as far as you know. No. As undergraduates, you probably don't know the full research literature in your field. And that's okay. You might duplicate something, but that's okay. Uh, when you do your PhD thesis, then you have to make sure nobody else has really, really done it before at all. <clears throat> so that's what a lit review is, is for. And for some of you, you might do an experiment. Uh, uh, for some of you, especially humanities people, the word experiment might scare you and that's okay. Instead of an experiment, you're going to do maybe an analysis. Maybe you're going to talk about some particular theory. Maybe there's a particular theory of literature, a uh, particular economic theory or model that you like, and it, you're not doing an experiment, but you're taking that theory or model and you're applying it to something like analyzing a poem or analyzing the economic situation of a particular country uh, and such. Then you discuss the results. Uh, and that's where you uh, again resort to the logical structure of maybe you know uh, main arguments one, two, and three here in the discussion of the results. Uh, for some of you, might have kind of a mixture in some fields like social science, where you entertain a research question and a thesis, and then you uh, don't do an experiment, but you do background lit review, and then you have your arguments. Uh, so something like that. <coughs> now. Problems come for uh, less experienced writers in the planning stages. Uh, ideally, as a writer, you want to do some good planning. Uh, maybe you want to brainstorm. And you want to find the kind of brainstorming and planning method that works for you. Ideally, you want to get to an outline, either on paper or at least in your head. Do any of you like to just sit down on the computer and just start typing your paper? Do any of you do that? Uh, unless you're really, really in a hurry. Probably not. There's some kind of planning. Even people who are able to sit down on the com computer and just start typing, they plan it in their head, hopefully. You don't just start writing and hope that magically it will come to you, right? It doesn't work. There's some kind of planning, and good writers will plan, uh, at least mentally. If they're an experienced writer, might just plan mentally. Um, if you're not a very experienced writer, plan on paper. And you need to find the technique that works for you. Now, ultimately, you should get to an outline, either on paper or in your brain, before you start really writing the whole paper. <coughs> but for some people, there are different brainstorming techniques that might work for you. You need to find out what's good for you. Um, some people like to just free write, write whatever randomly comes to mind on paper, and then organize it. Some people like to use a mind map. Do you know what a mind map is? just kind of write different ideas down and then you kind of draw circles and lines and organize things into kind of concept bubbles and draw things together. If that works for you, that's good. Um, some people though, especially if you're more extroverted, maybe you need to just chat with friends. Some people like verbal brainstorming. Uh, if you're that kind of person, try that. Do verbal brainstorming with your friends. Some people need to talk and verbalize in order to brainstorm and organize their ideas before they can go to the outline. Uh, some of you may prefer to do this on paper through uh, free writing or mind maps or flow charts or diagrams or whatever and then turn it into an outline. Uh, so find out what works for you, <coughs> um, especially if you're having trouble getting started. 
Uh, some people have trouble getting started because they try to force themselves to sit down at the computer when they're really not ready to write. They haven't really crystallized things yet by doing a proper planning state. Um, then you start writing and don't worry how bad it sounds the first time because you're going to revise. So some people have trouble writing because they're worried that it has to be perfect. And so they're kind of immobilized by this sort of fear of failure because you think, oh, it has to be perfect the first time. It doesn't have to be. It can, it's okay if it looks terrible, if it looks like uh, uh, a library exploded on your paper or something, whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter. Just get something out first and then go back and revise it. Uh, some people have trouble doing this because in the back of their mind there are these negative voices that they've internalized from the past, maybe a negative teachers or parents who pushed you too hard, and that's actually hindering you. So maybe you just need to get something out first, no matter how bad it sounds, turn off the voices, ignore them, just get something out, and then go back and add to it and revise it. <clears throat> so find the, the writing technique, the planning technique that works for you. Uh, then, uh, you may not necessarily write the introductory paragraph first. Some people like to start writing the intro paragraph. Some people write the intro paragraph last after they've written the body. But you should get the thesis out, um, either on paper or in your mind, the main idea of your paper. And this is where, of course, some people have trouble. Well, the thesis, you're going to probably, well, the intro is going to have some specific background. You may have a research question. So what is your question? What are you looking at? And what do you want to say about it? What is your specific thesis about your research question? Maybe your question is how to analyze this poem, or your research question is some kind of a scientific question or hypothesis that you want to address with an experiment, or your research question is, you know, how does this factor affect the society, or uh, how is the economic downturn affecting the education system of this country? Um, so define your research question and what you want to say about it, your thesis, and, and then the problem that some people have is they get to a thesis, but they don't really work out how they're going to explain and defend and argue for their thesis. Uh, and that's why outlining helps. If you make a thesis and then an outline, like your main points, A, B, C, D, <clears throat> then it's also going to help you if you put that in the introduction. So you're going to have maybe one clause or one sentence that defines your thesis. My thesis is X. And in order to talk about X, I need to look at A, B, C, D, or I need to dis we will dis this paper will discuss A, B, C, D in order to prove X, or in order to argue for X, or show that X is plausible. And so, <coughs> some writers leave that out of the introduction, and then the reader doesn't really know where you're going, where you're going to go. And sometimes the writer doesn't know where he or she is going. Because the writer has not defined really what are the main arguments that you know you're going to use to to prove or show X to the reader. <clears throat> so let's take an example, an example topic. Uh, let's say you're writing an essay or a research paper about the EMI policy, that's English mediated instruction. That's the university policy that requires most professors, most departments to teach in English. If you were uh, writing a research paper on this topic, how many of you would say, let's keep the policy, I like it? How many of you would be in favor? Okay. How many of you would be against it? Okay, some of you don't like it. How many of you would say, uh, we need to, we don't we need to get it, we don't need to throw it out, but we need to change it somehow? How many of you would say, well, let's modify this policy, let's change it somehow? How many of you would feel that way? Some of you? Okay. Now, if you write a paper and your thesis is simply, we need to modify the EMI policy, is that enough? We need to, you're going to argue, let's modify the EMI policy. Is that a good thesis? Okay, no, why not? It's not specific enough. You know, anyone could say, oh, we need to modify this. But if you don't have any specific proposals, is that interesting to a reader? No. Uh, you need to have a specific thesis, something you, you can say something about that's interesting, something that you can argue. 
even if the reader might disagree with you, just the arguing is going to be more intellectually stimulating if you have something specific to argue about. So, <clears throat> what would be a specific thesis along the lines of modify it? What's something specific you could say? Uh, a specific argument for modifying the policy. Okay, so now you're getting to the particular arguments. Uh, like one argument might be that not all students are comfortable with this, and that might be an argument for a thesis. But let's formulate a thesis first that's specific. What's a specific thesis um, along the lines of modify it? Something that's more specific. We should change it not to force professors who feel uncomfortable using English to do. Okay, so you should say, in other words, you kind of say make it optional yeah. for professors who feel comfortable. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Which means you're going to have to argue for changing the hiring process so that we hire, somehow we seek and hire professors who are proficient enough in English. So that's a, that's a very different way of arguing for modified. That's going to uh, so, and you're going to have to deal with counter arguments, you know, which we'll get to later. Some people might argue that, well, okay, if you say that, then in reality, no professors or very few new professors are going to be comfortable, and so they won't want to teach in English, and so the policy essentially becomes ineffective. And so you'll have to deal with those counter arguments, so unless you can argue that there is a way of hiring professors who are comfortable and ready, <coughs> in which case you have to look into how professors are hired, how university does its job searches, and how it hires professors and, and such. <clears throat> so, but that is one possibility. Um, that involves changing the way that we hire professors, the way we find professors who are ready to teach in English. What's another modification you could argue for? Well, you could argue that you need to uh, reduce the number of EMI courses that students have to take. That's another possibility. Uh, or you could argue on a department by department or college co by college basis. You could say, uh, well, either for the students that requirement needs to be changed for engineering students, science students. Uh, or you could say that um, <clears throat> it's uh, better to exempt say most humanities or it's better to exempt most science and engineering courses or departments from this requirement or instead of saying that the professor has to teach the whole course in English maybe modify so that it, the teacher can teach part of the course in English and part in Korean. <clears throat> so these might actually be easier to argue for so you want to make sure if you're taking like kind of a strong for or against, then it's going to be actually harder to argue one way or another. If you say, oh, you're totally in favor of the current policy, now that's, you could do that, but that's going to be harder to argue because you're going to have to deal with these people who are against you. Or if you're completely against and say completely abolish EMI, then you're going to have a harder time because you've got to convince or try to argue with these people. Uh, here, this is, it seems like a safe middle ground, but then you've got to be careful not just to say something vague like, oh, let's just change it. You need to propose specific changes. So if you're kind of arguing for something in the middle, you need to make sure you've got specific changes that you can argue for. <coughs> so, uh, you also have to define your scope. So if you're going to do a paper like this, what's your scope? Do you want to talk about EMI just at Code or just in your department or in your college uh, or in Korea in general or all over because there are other countries that are doing EMI type policies, Africa, um, um, the European Union, some countries and some schools in Europe are also adopting this. 
uh, either in terms of your argumentation or when it comes to finding evidence or sources to support you. What kind of arguments are you going to use? You mentioned like some students are not comfortable with that. That might be kind of a psychological or, or affective arguments making students uncomfortable. <coughs> uh, it might affect their motivation and such. Okay, so that's one way to do it. What are some other kinds of arguments uh, that you might make regarding EMI? Other kinds of arguments that you might make regarding EMI policy. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so that's going to be kind of a, a an argument from learning psychology. So you're going to, you can have arguments from learning psychology that have to do with how easy or hard it is for students to understand the content material. Uh, we have that's kind of related to this argument too. <clears throat> you could make. Um, other arguments in terms of learning psychology, how effective is it is for students learning the content field. You can make practical arguments in terms of how well they do. Uh, could you do an experiment to show this? If you're looking at like, practical learning outcomes, do students learn better ultimately under EMI compared to non-EMI? Is there a way you could uh, do a scientific test to show this? How? Oh. Teach some things mm -hmm. by using different language. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you can find uh, a well done study where like other factors are well controlled for, that might be a good type of evidence if you can find that. You probably don't have time to do it yourself or the ability. But you can make arguments. You can make arguments in terms of lang uh, language learning. Uh, you can make ar economic arguments. You can make all kinds of arguments. But can you do all of these arguments in one paper? Can you do all of this in one paper? No. And that's a common mistake that uh, newer writers might make. <coughs> they will define maybe a topic or a thesis that's too broad, that's not doable in one paper, uh, that might actually be more of a book topic. Uh, so, you need to probably define the scope of your paper. Are you going to be looking at mainly um, learning outcomes? Are you going to look at psychological aspects? Are you going to look at linguistic aspects? So, in the way you organize your paper, you need to, to, to define the scope uh, of your thesis, your topic, and the kinds of arguments you're going to make. <coughs> because this is a common mistake. Uh, some many students, uh, whether it's in your first language or your second language, will try to take on a paper topic that's too broad, too big. And this is the biggest mistake of new writers. They take on a topic that's too broad, and then halfway through the paper, they're lost. They don't know where the paper is going because they, it's like they're swallowing an ocean. They're trying to drink a, an ocean, and, and they can't. And so. Uh, you have to make sure from the beginning that this is really doable in a six page or eight page or ten page research paper in this class. Uh, and also, are you going to def do this from maybe the student's point of view in terms of learning or from the teacher's point of view in terms of teach their teaching abilities and their English abilities? <coughs> what kind of evidence and sources are you going to look for? Uh, what kind of evidence or sources would you look for if you're writing a research paper like this? Some of you might like to do an experiment if you have the time and the resources. That would be awesome if you can actually do a classroom experiment. And in education, there are ways of doing that. Uh, but maybe you can't do that. What are some other things you can look for? What are other kinds of sources that you might look for? 
Okay. Okay. So that's actually a good, uh, good way to start searching in the net. If you're in English, Google Scholar, by the way, is a good place to start. Google Scholar, scholar.google.com, which limits your Google search to academic sources. But is everything out there valid and credible, even if it's on Google? No. And these are mistakes that, again, some people make. You don't want popular sources. If it's a survey by a student newspaper, is that a good source? A survey conducted by a student newspaper, like the Kodai newspaper or the, the Hongdae student newspaper on EMI, is that a good source? Probably not, because it's not done by people who are, I mean, these are undergraduate reporters. They're probably not trained in proper survey and questionnaire design. Um, what about a master's thesis? Somebody's master's thesis? Is that a good source? So-so. Um, that's kind of a, a very mediocre source. And some students will rely too much on ma a, ma a master's thesis. That's not really a strong source because that person is still a relative novice or beginner in terms of research methods. <clears throat> and a, re a master's thesis um, doesn't have the same the kind of criteria as for a PhD dissertation. If it's a PhD dissertation, it's better. If it's something published in research journals, that's uh, better. Is a newspaper a good source? Something in the newspaper? It's kind of so-so. Maybe for your introduction at most, but in terms of your body arguments for a good research paper, uh, popular sources like newspapers, popular books are not really great. You have to be careful of that kind of thing, your evidence, because it's not going to communicate to the reader. So problems, a lot of students have topics that are too broad, they take on too much, then they get lost, and they, they drown in information. They have too much information, or sometimes they have too little information, or the topic might be too narrow, uh, and it's not also not doable in one paper, maybe you need to get more information. Maybe you've tried a topic that's just too narrow, and there's not enough information uh, out there. Uh, some students will try to frame their arguments too emotionalistically or subjectively. Subjective, like, I think, I think we should do this. And I think or I, again, is, is weak. It doesn't communicate because you're not being, you're not sounding objective or scientific. <clears throat> Although in humanities, it's a little more common to say I in some humanities writing. When you get to the introduction, um, well, in your introduction, you're probably going to present a specific, maybe a research problem or question, maybe specific, or maybe specific background information, a specific example, or a rationale. Maybe explain why this topic is important. So as you get to your thesis, you, maybe you're explaining why this topic is important, a rationale. Why should the reader care uh, uh, about this? Why is this topic important? Why is my, my idea important or interesting? So mistakes that people make here. So for example, I've assigned uh, in the past sometimes students to write uh, a research paper about a specific aspect of English education in Korea. And their essays start with something really general like, English is a global language. Is that a good introduction for a research paper on English education? or English is really hard for Koreans. Is that a really interesting introduction? <clears throat> Not really. Because it's something that's obvious that the reader knows. It's kind of like the sky is blue uh, kind of introduction. Now, the reason that my students do this, I know, is that in traditional Korean and Chinese style essays, in tradition, especially in humanities, you would do something like that. You might start with kind of a very general feel-good introduction that's mean, meant to design, that's designed to connect with the reader and make the reader feel kind of at ease, right? But in English, that doesn't work. It's not that there's anything necessarily wrong with the traditional Korean style, but that doesn't work in English because in academic English, we have different ways of communicating. Uh, we have different rhetorical structure than in traditional Korean Chinese essays. And so, here we're not trying to connect with the reader in a personal level or make the reader feel good. We're kind of more in English, in English academic writing, kind of more in your face. 
we start with, with something more specific. We don't want anything that's common, maybe specific introduction to theories or background information or past research or specific examples and such. <clears throat> so you want to avoid uh, information that the reader would already know uh, or that, all, that almost all readers would know. <clears throat> Uh, you want to kind of lead more specifically into your thesis with specific background information. You want to avoid language that's too emotional or subjective or fluffy sounding. Some Korean writers will try to do kind of a very fluffy, nice sounding language. And again, that's traditional Korean style. That doesn't work. It should be more serious and academic. Um, a weak or a vague thesis. So you want a thesis that's specific that's going to be interesting to argue about, whether people agree or disagree. Um, sometimes readers don't really explain or it's not clear why the thesis or the topic should be interesting. Why is this interesting? Why are you doing it? What's the purpose? Uh, is it going to contribute to our understanding of something or is this just your intellectual exercise? And again, not providing specific points for the thesis which I mentioned earlier, no specific overview or plan. So again, <coughs> for example, a specific thesis might be, this paper is going to argue for, uh, is going to argue maybe that uh, this model can better explain this situation. That's a thesis. And then in the same sentence or the next sentence, uh, in order to show this, uh, uh, the following will be examined, A, B, and C. And you kind of delineate the f different things you're going to look at. Or you're going to give, give a brief sketch of the main arguments in your intro, in your thesis, uh, right after your thesis. And in order to show this, uh, we will uh, show that A is the case, and then B is the case, and C is the case, uh, in order to show that X is true. So if you look at any academic paper that maybe you're looking at for your research papers, uh, generally they will follow that kind of structure in the introdu introduction. Specific background info, usually an explicit thesis, and it's followed immediately by a sort of plan or overview of the main points of the paper, and that helps the reader to know what's coming. <coughs> um, arguments, okay, a little bit of logic. Uh, you know that you probably know about inductive and deductive and such. Um, the overall structure of English academic papers is generally deductive, basically present a thesis. Uh, and then you provide points to defend it. That's deductive style. Some of the particular arguments in the body might be deductive or inductive. So inductive examples could be empirical data. So if you're talking about the EMI, an essay about EMI, what might be some sort of empirical or observational data? Would it be, well, all of my classmates are really struggling in their English classes. Now, is that good empirical data? Or I'm really struggling, I'm having a hard time? Uh, no, because it's not really objective, it's not been published, it's not very scientific or such. You want something that's been published by people who are scholars or have some reputation, um, not just your own experiences, uh, except maybe in the introduction of your paper. So if it's in an essay on EMI, it might be some kind of empirical data, some studies that people have done surveys, questionnaires. Um, maybe people have observed classrooms, education researchers have, have observed classrooms, uh, such. Sometimes you make arguments by inferencing, analogy, or example. Likewise, empirical data is often used in deductive arguments. Uh, so in order to prove A, I've got this scientific data. In order to prove B, I've got this scientific data, this research data, these studies based on empirical data and such. Other kinds of deductive things, well, in some fields you mainly use logical argumentation, so you need to know what really in your field what kind of um, arguments and data or evidence you're, you need to use, you need to be good at. Logical arguments and syllogism, you know, syllogism is kind of like A is true, B is true, therefore C must be true. Okay, it's kind of boring stuff, but in some fields you do that a lot like in philosophy and theoretical linguistics. To some degree in literary analysis you do that a little bit. Maybe you're making cause and effect arguments, especially in science and social science and correlation. Uh, scientific method from which you get empirical data, quantitative data, statistics and such. Uh, so you, if it's an EMI, if it's an essay about EMI, you might be looking at published studies where people have done, you know, scientific analysis of students and 
um, their feelings or their grades or their learning outcomes in EMI classes compared to other classes uh, and such. <coughs> in uh, humanities, some fields in humanities is going to be a lot of logical arguments. Business and you know, social science and such, you're going to get a lot of cause and effect and correlation kind of arguments um, in scientific fields. Um, some social science fields, a lot of that stuff. <coughs> uh, there's also something called sort of optimization logic. And so in some fields you deal with really complex stuff, it's really hard to prove things. And this could be true sometimes when you're arguing about literary analysis or economics or things that are kind of vague. So it's kind of hard to argue that through hard data that X is absolutely true. What you might be arguing is that X is the best explanation. And you might do this by showing, well, A, B, and C don't work, or A, B, C and doesn't, don't work as well, and that X does a better job of explaining things than A, or X does a better job than A, B, or C. So sometimes this might be the argument that you want to use that you know this theory does a better job of explaining this novel than other theories or this theory does a better job of explaining the economics after German reunification than those other theories and so uh, this might be uh, the kind of logic that you use in some of your fields so you kind of want to know is this a good way to argue things uh, <clears throat> in some fields this might work when you're dealing with complex things. It might be hard to really disprove A, B, and C, but maybe it's, it's possible to argue that simply X does a better job of explaining things than A or A, B, and C. <coughs> um, so counter arguments, okay. Um, you have to anticipate that some of your readers will not believe you. It could be Logical, they may have problems with your logic and they may have their own logical arguments. It could be empirical uh, or interpretive. Um, even in a scientific paper, you've got data that you have to interpret and show that this data proved this theory or hypothesis. Well, somebody might not believe you and you have to anticipate that somebody else might object and say, hey, I think we should interpret the data that way, that I don't agree with your interpretation. Maybe these data in better support my theory, not your theory. You have to be ready for that kind of objection and you have to deal with that. Uh, if in literature you're arguing for a particular interpretation, people might object and say, hey, I don't agree that your interpretation is valid or is possible, and you have to deal with those kinds of possible logical objections to your analysis, your approach, the way you've applied a certain theory to certain uh, data set or certain set of historical events or a certain poem or novel. <clears throat> so there are some other examples in here, but you might deal with those with your own counter arguments by saying, okay, what you say is true, but that doesn't really apply to the situation that I'm talking about, or does it really apply to this theory? Uh, that might be true in that case, but in terms of my data set, your objection doesn't really apply to this kind of data. Uh, or your evidence for that is weak, my evidence is stronger uh, because I did this in my experiment. Uh, you might point out logical problems with their objection. You might provide your own counter examples. And in some fields, providing counter examples is a way of destroying somebody's argument, especially in philosophy and in theoretical fields. Provide a good counter exa example that might destroy somebody's argument. Or you contrast your thesis with the opposing view and show that yours is better. Yours does a better job of explaining things. <clears throat> Typical errors. Biggest problem that I see, especially among Korean and Chinese writers, is that they oversummarize other points of view. And <clears throat> this comes from um, the traditional Korean Chinese way of writing essays where you kind of talk about one viewpoint, you spend a good part of the essay kind of summarizing one viewpoint, then you summarize the other viewpoint, then you kind of at the end express your view. Uh, and so what happens is when Chinese and Korean uh, writers try to write in English academic style, 
they end up over summarizing other points of view. Uh, or even if it's sources that support their point of view, they spend too much time summarizing them. So when you're dealing with possible counter objections, you don't spend a lot of time to summarize what they are unless they are maybe less familiar or um, <coughs> uh, uh, complicated. Instead, instead of spending a lot of time to summarize what they are, summarize them briefly, if possible, with a simple subordinate clause like, although some have claimed that, a simple phrase like that, although, and then your main clause where you provide in the main clause your counter-argument. Uh, although so-and-so has said, or although so-and-so has argued, or something like so-and-so you know, Smith and Jones, 1990, argue that, however, these data show that their claim doesn't apply or work for the situation. So you can use these contrastive conjunctions, although, however, uh, uh, maybe but, to the contrary, and other contrastive markers, to briefly frame a, uh, someone else's objection and then provide your response. And that's how we uh, usually often summarize them. You don't give too much space to the opposing viewpoint. You briefly summarize what the opposing viewpoint might be uh, and then provide your response with one of these contrasting conjunctions. Uh, other mistakes that people make, they try to provide overly strong counterarguments, and they don't have enough evidence for their strong counterarguments. Uh, bad thing is if you misrepresent the other point of view, if you're writing about something controversial, and you misrepresent what the other side really says, you oversimplify what they say, you want to be careful not to do that. Because it shows that you don't understand the other viewpoint uh, or that you're not honest enough to really explain and deal with their objections. <clears throat> uh, something else is kind of cherry picking evidence. So cherry picking means you've got all these, maybe there's evidence or different research studies. Some might support you, some might be against what you have to say. And you ignore the ones that you don't like, and you simply cite and refer to the ones that provide evidence for your viewpoint. That's called cherry picking, You're kind of just selectively picking the ones that look good to you. You ignore the rest very conveniently. Uh, that's either lazy or dishonest. And if you do that, the readers will see that you're not really bothering to uh, look at the different evidence in the studies and deal with them intelligently. It might be the case that you're thesis is simply wrong, or your thesis is maybe only partly true, maybe the situation is more complex, and in some cases it's true, in some cases it's not true, and you have to maybe adjust to the fact that the reality is maybe more complex than what you've anticipated, that your thesis isn't uh, correct or it's only correct under certain situations. Those are the mistakes that people make. So again, common problems. Uh, again, the English argumentation style, the rhetorical or argumentation style is very deductive. It's very direct. Thesis, kind of main points A, B, C, D. Um, as opposed to the East Asian, traditional East Asian style. Um, probably some people in more so humanities fields are still influenced by this traditional Chinese Korean style. These diagrams are kind of oversimplistic, I know, but these are famous diagrams in uh, linguistics that kind of overgeneralize and oversimplify the situation. But generally, uh, that's the kind of style where you have a very general introduction and it kind of summarizes one view, kind of summarizes the other, and then you present your view. In Western academic writing, we're kind of more direct in the face. We don't care if we offend the reader. Sometimes we want to offend the reader. Uh, we want sometimes to make the reader uncomfortable. We want to argue with the reader, uh, which doesn't sound very nice in terms of uh, East Asian culture, but that's kind of the Western intellectual tradition and our writing style is influenced by that. Other kind of problems, uh, logical fallacies and the arguments of the body of the paper. You want to make sure that you're not making emotional arguments, uh, that you're not using emotional language, that you don't say, oh, that's ridiculous or that's silly, that's laughable. You want to avoid that kind of tone that doesn't sound very professional. Um, you'll want to avoid overgeneralizing, either making statements that are too general that are not really supported by the evidence, and maybe things are really more complicated. Uh, 
and you will make yourself look bad if you overgeneralize and you show you're not really aware of uh, the details. An example might be, oh, I think we should just it could be a generalization to say, I think we should keep the EMI as it is, it's great, or we should just completely get rid of it. Uh, might be over generalizations uh, if you don't have enough evidence to support that kind of view. Or if you exaggerate claims, claims that are exaggerated. This kind of stuff is what politicians do. Uh, this is what advertisers do. They typically use these kinds of devices. So if you give your essay to maybe a friend and they say, oh, this sounds like a politician wrote it, or this sounds like it was written by an advertising company, that's not a good sign. Uh, in fact, it might help to exchange your essays with a friend, have your friend read it, critique it. Um, there are, I won't go too much into detail about this because we don't have time, but there's a handout on my website about that. Again, cherry picking, I mentioned that. A straw man argument. Uh, this is where you misrepresent the other side. So again, maybe you overgeneralize what the other viewpoint is or you misunderstand what the opposing viewpoint is or you actually misrepresent it. Um, this is called a straw man. So you're not arguing against the real opponent but a, a fake straw man. And it's easy to set up a fake straw man and shoot it down. Uh, it's easy to draw, to misrepresent your opponents or misrepresent the other side and then shoot down that straw man. Uh, it's easy, but it's kind of either dishonest or shows that you don't understand it. <clears throat> so you have to be careful to make sure you understand the opposing viewpoints, especially if it's a controversial issue. Um, it could be a controversial social political issue, it could be just an, something that's an intellectual controversy in your field. You have to make sure you understand what they really, really say before you criticize them or try to critique them because if you don't, if you overgeneralize and misrepresent what they say, that makes your arguments look bad. Sadly, this is commonly done still in some areas of academia. Uh, there are some older academics who still do this, but it's not good because it leads to fights in academia. <coughs> Evidence and sources. So. Uh, again, in some fields, you use the evidence you use to support your arguments, your claims. It might be more theoretical or logical, like in philosophy papers, and to some degree in literature papers. It could be empirical evidence that's kind of qualitative. People do surveys or they uh, do observational studies. Anthropologists, sociologists, education researchers. It could be quantitative, where you do experiments, you do statistical analysis. Uh, so you need to be aware of really what your world is. Which world do you live in? Uh, is your field a theoretical one? Is your field a qualitative one? Is your field a quantitative one? Because that affects the kind of data you're going to use. For example, education. There, if you're uh, within a kind of quantitative area of, say, education or language research, you probably don't want to really refer to this kind of stuff because you know, that's all. Each of these is a huge, huge area. And so there's enough here. If you do this, you, if you're writing to other quantitatively minded people and you try to cite this, you're not going to persuade them. Uh, you're not going to convince them. Um, so if you're quantitative, your field is quantitative, then be careful of something that's really uh, outside of your research area or your field. Um, Common problems, if you're using any kind of source, it should be cited in the body of the paper and then at the end. Uh, if you have citations at the end references and they're not in the body of the paper, that's not good. It's like you're just throwing in references for decoration. It's like bling. You know hip hop stars wear this heavy gold jewelry to show off? It, it, we call it, in slang, they call it bling bling. So if you put in a lot of references just for the sake of putting in references and you don't really use them meaningfully, that's citation bling. And it could be putting in references in the end that are not cited in the body of the paper, or it could be putting stuff even in the body of the paper, but you don't really use it meaningfully. You're just throwing in references, even though you haven't really read them and you haven't really used them meaningfully. That's citation bling, and again, it looks 
obviously fake because the reader can see you didn't really read all of these sources that you cited. Uh, that's not good. So avoid citation bling. Uh, every reference cited in the body of the paper should be cited at the end. Everything that's at the end should have been cited in the body of the paper. Uh, let's see whether you're using, uh, there are different citation systems and, and such which we'll talk about. Some people don't bother to paraphrase or summarize, uh, copy and paste jobs. That looks obvious really to professors who are experienced graders. It's obvious when you don't paraphrase, when you plagiarize, uh, because for one thing there's an obvious shift in style from your style to the style of the text that you've copied and pasted in there. It's obvious. Uh, and if you have a professor who is a careful reader, he's going to grade you and mark you down for um, plagiarizing or not properly citing because it's obvious. And you get into grad school, it's a big problem. You can get into big trouble. Um, mundane information that readers already know. It's boring. It's not really interesting. Uh, again, non-academic sources like if you cite uh, USA Today, it's not very good. Uh, unreliable sources. Um, you study, you know, a study done by the student newspaper. That's uh, not really reliable. Uh, or just cite what a politician said. Uh, another thing is data trawling. So uh, this is a trawling boat, a boat that kind of puts out this big net, and it just catches whatever comes into the net, and they just pull up whatever. Uh, so some students do this. They just throw in. They just go to Google, and type in the search words, and then they come up with some sources in Google or Google Scholar. And they say, oh, that looks good. I'll put it in my paper. I'll put in this reference in my paper. And it's obviously you haven't really read the reference. Or maybe you just read the introduction of a scholarly paper and go, oh, that looks good. I'll put this in my paper. Well, maybe what the body of the paper says is actually more complex or different. And so if you just cite, if you just read maybe the introduction of that paper and when really the situation that's discussed in the body of the paper is more complex or con contrary to what you're saying with it, then that's going to look bad for you. Uh, so uh, use papers that you've actually read. Uh, maybe you can skip the experimental part, but you read the introduction, the lit review, and the discussion section at the end. Make sure you've meaningfully read the papers before you cite them. Uh, don't just throw in stuff that you get from a Google search because it's going to be obvious to the reader, uh, the professor who's grading it, that you've simply done data trawling. Uh, it's like, oh, that looks good, that looks good. I'll throw it in my paper. You know, like the fishermen who are just plucking out whatever they find from the net. Uh, <clears throat> what else? Some resources. You can go to my website, this tiny URL dot com slash Kentley7. In the top I've got a link to well, EAP, that's kind of general English for academic purposes. Uh, I don't have, sorry I didn't put that reference in the web, uh, handout. You go to the, uh, at the top there's a link to my writing aids, and there I've got a bunch of other handouts about writing, uh, specific writing issues, Google Scholar, citation, paraphrasing techniques, or links to some of the courses I've taught. Uh, you might want to write down this website. It's not on the handout, sorry. I didn't put it on the handout. It's tinyurl.com URL, slash Kentley7. Can you read that? Can you read the pretty purple font? Okay. Uh, uh, I've got a lot of stuff under the writing aids. A lot of the same stuff is under some of the courses that I teach, like my uh, writing class that I teach here. Uh, also, the online writing lab at Purdue, that's OWL. Dot English dot Purdue, dot edu, Purdue University. They have a great website where you can look up how to use MLA citation, how to use APA citation, punctuation, capitalization rules, uh, how do you start writing a, a research paper, and uh, all kinds of basic writing tips, uh, including ESL uh, writing tips, uh, transitions and such. By the way, on my writing aids website, I've got links to also transitionals. Transitionals are things like, you know, since, because, therefore, thus, then, uh, afterwards, if. Transitional words that help manage the flow of ideas and uh, including a handout that describes the problems that Koreans have. So you go to my writing website and then go down to transitionals and there are several handouts about these kinds of transitional expressions. Uh, for example, sometimes Koreans uh, and other ESL writers overuse but 
but, 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 and they don't use a variety like though, however, although, while, whereas, to the contrary. And so there are several handouts about uh, use of those transitional words. Um, also, maybe do brainstorming with your friends when it comes to starting a paper, or when you've got a draft, a good draft, maybe do peer editing with your friends, your classmates on your own, kind of exchange papers, read and critique each other's papers. Uh, maybe your professor is too busy to look at your draft, but you can exchange papers with a, you know, classmates, have kind of a homework party, it's a great idea. Exchange your papers and critique each other's papers. Give each other some comments and feedback and get some feedback from uh, your classmates on your paper. So you can do your own peer editing with your friends and that's a great social activity. Uh, nothing is more fun than spending an evening reading research papers and critiquing them and critiquing your argumentation. All right, any questions? One question, okay. Uh, about the mentioning about anticipating objection in paper. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering about, um, are you suggesting that we need to present the uh, objection directly in the paper that like, we, uh, we think that like, blah, 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 and our position for that is? OK. I can, there are several cases. One might be, it might be something that somebody's actually discussed, maybe in published research. It's like, so you might cite it, like Smith and Jones argue that, however, uh, uh, you can point out a weakness in their argumentation or say, or, but our evidence from our experiment shows, however, or something hypo you could think of maybe a very likely objection, like some might argue that, however, da, 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 or although some might object to this by saying X, uh, and then you present your answer to that. Uh, <clears throat> um, or it, uh, something like, it could be argued that, uh, or some might object by saying that, however, and then you present your answer to that. So there are different ways of doing it. And also when you, uh, and that can be a value of doing peer editing because maybe you might not think of these objections. So that's why I highly recommend doing peer editing session. Maybe get some classmates together because maybe you won't anticipate objections to your uh, thesis, but maybe they can. And maybe they can say, oh, here's something you didn't think about. And they can tell you, then you can deal with that in your paper. So that's really, the best thing you can do, I think, is, is some peer editing with some, some good classmates who have good minds and who are honest. Yes? Um, when you want to provide some empirical examples to uh, to support your argument, and then you get the information from newspaper or like history textbook, and then you have to like, do some Yes. 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 Yeah. Any source you use should be cited. And uh, uh, I don't know, what's your field? Um, political science. Political science. Uh, do you use APA or ASA? I don't know. Don't know. Okay. You might want to find out what the citation system is in your field. In many humanities fields, like, like English or literature, it's MLA. Some history fields use uh, Chicago style. Uh, many uh, social science and education fields use a style called, it's called APA. Um, and Sociologists might use ASA. Engineering might use IEEE, probably in many science fields like biology and chemistry use CBE. I mean, you might want to find out what the particular style system is for citing these references in the text at the end. And then you find out what it is, then you can do a, a Google search and find, uh, well, this is good for APA and MLA. For others, you probably have to you know, do Google search and find out what's the right way to cite you know, a newspaper article in my citation system, or how do I cite, you know, that kind of source, if you don't know that. Or sometimes you can look at the published research papers that you're reading and imitate. Now, that's how I learned first how to do APAs. I simply imitated the style that I saw. Oh, that's how they cite a journal, that's how they cite a book. Okay, I do that. Uh-huh. Yes. Okay, so, and of course that diagram was overly general. It's not a good diagram, but it's 
popular, so I put in it. It goes back to a famous linguist named Kaplan in 1966 who first came out with a famous article in which he contrasted the rhetorical styles. Uh, there were some problems with this article, but he contrasted the, the rhetorical style of English versus other cultures. Uh, and a lot of people since then have done other research. It's an area known as contrastive rhetoric. Contrastive rhetoric. So there's been a lot of linguistic research on how different cultures have their own rhetorical styles. And that's a problem if you grow up in one culture, then you have to adjust to the English academic writing style, which is different from, say, is very different from the traditional Korean Chinese writing style because the expectations, how you're supposed to structure things, how you're supposed to argue for things are very different. So just look for contrastive rhetoric if you're interested in linguistics. Okay. Uh, again, there are a lot more handouts here on these websites. Uh, you go here and you just, it's, uh, they have so many handouts, it's kind of, they do it now like a search engine, so you just go to their main page and just type in what you want to look up and it'll give you the links for it and such. So there's just some good websites. So good luck with your research papers and I hope you enjoy your writing or at least do well in your writing. Thank you.